Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, thank you, Brother Williamson, for the introduction. I do research and... Um, oh, interesting. Um, yes, I do do research in bioengineering, and he expressed that some of you may want to talk about that. Unfortunately, we're going to be talking about that at all in the sermon this morning, not surprisingly. Um, but I am looking forward to, to getting to meet some of you and, and to worship with you this morning. Um, I appreciate what Brother Coachella said in the thoughts before the communion this morning and saying that remembering Christ's sacrifice, the most important event in all history. Prior to that event, everything looks forward to it. And in our time and everything after that event, everything looked back to it. Uh, if you turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, the very end of Luke's gospel, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus says uh, <clears throat> to those with him before he ascends in verse 44 of Luke 24, he says, now he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, these are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written. So what he's just said is he said, what's written in the law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. Now Jesus' Bible, he had the same Old Testament that we had. The law was called Torah, the prophets is called Nevi'im, and Psalms is a part of the section called writings, which is Ketuvim, T-N-K. Sometimes it's called Tanakh. That's the Hebrew Bible. Jesus is saying, when I read the Hebrew Bible, law, prophets, psalms, when I read the Hebrew Bible, guess what it says? Verse 47, he summarizes it for them. Or verse 46. Thus it is written, the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. Repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So you take this complicated, you know, the majority of our Bibles is the Old Testament. And Jesus says, when I read it, this is the message that I get. There's going to be a Messiah. He's going to bring forgiveness to everyone. Now, sometimes we miss that forest for the trees when we read through it, but Jesus summarizes that for us. And it's a message similar to what Coche uh, Brother Coachella just told us. Everything pointed to this event of Christ. If you flip over to Acts chapter 3, Peter, in his second sermon, so-called, his first sermon was the one on Pentecost, a little bit more famous, perhaps. But in chapter 3, Peter relays a similar message. In Acts chapter 3, um, verse 24. Actually, let's start in verse 22. He says, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, to whom you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet will be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward all announced these times, talking about the coming kingdom of Christ that he had established and inaugurated with his blood. And so Peter relays a similar message. When we study prophets of the Old Testament, it's important to remember that. And we're going to do that this morning because we're going to be looking at uh, Haggai, Haggai's message, a really, really short book in your Bible, two chapters only. But as we read through it this morning, I want you to remember what Jesus said and what Peter said and, and the message of before communion. Everything points to Christ. And so let's have that lens with us this morning as we examine the scriptures. The other thing, um, when we consider studying the Old Testament, Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, these things are written for your learning. So there are applications, right? I mean, Haggai, hard to miss the message there. It's about motivating them to rebuild the temple. And while today there's not a physical temple we need to go and build, there's not. But there is an application for us. And so there's th those are the two lens that I want us to, cons the two perspectives that I want us to consider this morning as we study Haggai. So open your Bibles to Haggai. <clears throat> a short book, and you know, when, when I'm visiting somewhere, I'm not with you every Sunday. I've, maybe you studied Haggai last week, and that's sort of the risk that I run. Um, but... It's, a, it's, it's two chapters, and I just want to, I've prepared some thoughts this morning that I think um, are instructive for us. So open your Bibles to Haggai. We'll start in chapter one. Now, first, some background. Let's remember where we are 
when we talk about the prophet Haggai. <clears throat> so Ezra referenced Haggai and Zechariah in chapter 5 of Ezra. And he said that Haggai and Zechariah were prophets at the time. So it's the, the timeline is exactly right there where Ezra was. Or where was that? Let's go back a little bit, okay? Um, the kingdom of Israel was split in 1 Kings 11 following Solomon's reign. His son Rehoboam got the southern kingdom Judah. Jeroboam takes over the northern kingdom, also referred to later as Israel or just Ephraim. And the south was referred to as Judah. Fast forward to 2 Kings chapter 17. The nation of Assyria comes in and takes over the northern kingdom. They send some of the Israelites to their capital, which was in, um, where was their capital? Nineveh? Yeah, it was in Nineveh. Uh, the Assyrian capital, and then they bring in some foreigners into Samaria, which was the capital of, of the northern kingdom. Um, <clears throat> Hezekiah was the king at the time in the, in the southern kingdom, and what do, you, what do you think Assyria tries to do? They try to go into Judah as well, and they're unsuccessful. At the end of Hezekiah's reign, what's reported about him in 2 Kings, um, we have this little tidbit about um, Hezekiah brings in some people from Babylon and shows them the temple, all the things in the temple, all these great treasures, and it's at that moment where it's prophesied Babylon will come in and will take captive these people. It will take all these things and destroy this temple, actually. It was prophesied there. And then it finally comes to fruition um, only four chapters later in 2 Kings 24. Uh, King Jehoiakim is now in reign in Judah. Babylon takes over. So the, 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 the Judah, the people of Judah are exiled to Babylon and foreigners come into Judah. The temple, which was in Jerusalem, was destroyed during this time in 586 BC under the king Nebuchadnezzar. And you can read about that in 2 Kings 25. So really, really awful times. Um, temples destroyed. They've been removed from their holy land. When you read through Deuteronomy, it's always talking about you will do these things in the place of God's choosing, and we find out that that's eventually Jerusalem. And here it's been destroyed. The temple's been destroyed, a major part of their worship. But in 539, Persia, the nation of Persia, comes in and takes over Babylon under the reign of Cyrus II. And this is where, um, in Ezra chapter 1, this is where we read a proclamation made by Cyrus to initiate rebuilding the temple. <clears throat> And he actually, it actually says in the text there that he was roused by God to do so. So this is from God. Um, and so anyone, so now we're, we're out of the exile now, okay? And anyone, King Cyrus would allow anyone who wanted to come back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, he would let them. And um, this had to have been, if you put yourself in those people's shoes, this had to have been sort of motivating because it fulfilled prophecy. And a lot of times, you don't always get to live in the time where you hear the, the prophecy made and then where you see it happen. But for some people, some people were there and saw the first temple and are now coming back with them. And it was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah that within 70 years, three generations, King Nebuchadnezzar, his son, and his grandson, they would reign, and then in his grandson's reign, they would come back. And that's literally happening right now. They had to be sitting there going, this is awesome. Oh my goodness, Jeremiah was right. <clears throat> it's reminiscent of when the Israelites were marched out of Egypt across the Red Sea by God. For 100, 400 years prior to that event, they were told, you'll settle in the land of Canaan. I promise you, that's a promise, a prophecy. And for 400 years, they were looking for this time, looking for this time, and lo and behold, in the midst of, um, in the midst of being under slavery in Egypt, God through these plagues and through the leadership of Moses, marches them across the Red Sea and is taking them to the Promised Land. You would have thought that would have been motivating, right? <clears throat> but of course, the book of Numbers is much longer than it needed to be. A lot of up and down in the book of Numbers. So um, similarly, these people should have been able to attribute their favorable circumstance, right? Here we are marching back to our Holy Land. They should have been able to attribute that to God and that should have been motivating for them. So they're coming back under the leadership of Joshua, who was the high priest at the time, and Zerubbabel, who was the governor. <clears throat> and so the, the people return, and they get back. They start trying to reestablish their religious practices. They rebuild the altar so that they can offer the burnt sacrifices that they needed to do. 
they celebrated the Feast of Booths as soon as they got back and got things up and running. So they're trying to get back to the way that things were. They start to rebuild the temple. They lay the foundation of the temple. Now when you read in Ezra, after they lay the foundation, they look at it and they go, man, this is not what I remember it being, right? They, they could sort of extrapolate and say, ooh, this is not going to be like the first one, not as glorious. I mean, that has an effect of discouraging the people. So eventually, because of that discouragement and also because their work in rebuilding the temple was frustrated by, uh, it says the local people, it says um, in the text, this is in, let's see, this is in Ezra 4, talks about the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin. Basically, it was, um, it was locals that the returnees were afraid of, and in part, it in part motivated them building the altar, actually, so that they could seek divine protection, perhaps. Um, so anyway, because of all these things, rebuilding the temple stops. And for 15 years, they make zero progress on the temple. <clears throat> and that is until uh, Darius I, um, when they start to rebuild it again, and this is exactly why Haggai wrote his letter, wrote his, uh, was prophesying at the time, was to motivate the, pe the people to rebuild the temple. Um, <clears throat> so his, the book here, two chapters, consists of four reports. If I were dividing it up, I probably would have done four chapters. Some of them would have been short because they're not super long prophecies, all of them. Um, but it's four reports, and it was written to motivate finishing the temple, to validate this second temple, to make them sure that it is a temple that is okay, and anything, any, um, anyone who looks at it and sees that it's less glorious than it seems like it should be, God would take care of that, is the final message. Uh, and then finally, a, a look to forward to an everlasting establishment. And so remember, the two perspectives, looking forward to Christ, and also applications for us. Now, the temple does not get finished in this book. It will finish four years later. Um, but anyway, it was successful in motivating the people, to say the least. All right, so I'm not gonna, we're not going to look at every single report this morning. You could do a lesson on all of them. Um, but I do want to summarize <clears throat> each of the reports. So the first one is in Haggai 1, 1 through 15. That's where scripture reading came from this morning. Um, it was to Zerubbabel and Joshua. And in one word, it had to do with priorities. Your priorities are not right. You're not prioritizing God. You're prioritizing your own selfish interests at the time. And the time to re rebuild the temple is now. So the first one had to do with, with priorities. And we read later that their response was favorable. They responded in obedience and reverence to God, and they start to rebuild the temple. The second report is in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. It's about two months after that first one. And in a word, this one is hope. So the people looked at this temple and they said, it doesn't look as glorious as I think that it should be. But God tells them, the temple may not seem like much, but take courage and be confident. I'm with you anyway. A future event is coming. We're going to talk about this event. It, it refers to it as a shaking of the heaven and the earth. And a future house will be a part of that event. Um, and it will be, be better than even the first one of the, of the temple. All right. The third report is in Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. It comes about a month later after the second one, and also the fourth one happens on the same day, it turns out, month 9, day 24. The third one had to do with cleansing defilement. It, refer, it gives this analogy about holy food touching a garment. See, holy food could touch things and it would become holy, but that, and that's in Leviticus 16. But the thing that was touched and now holy could not spread the holiness like the holy food, food could. And so it gives this analogy, it's saying, you know, the land might be holy, but it won't holify you. But you, but the way uncleanness works is the other way. If you have an unclean thing and it touches me, I can spread the uncleanness. And so they came back and the land was not producing. And it's because they were defiling the land. Just because it's God's set apart land, holy land, because it's set apart for God, didn't make them holy necessarily, but them being defiled because their heart was not right could defile the land. That's the point of, of the third report. And then the last report, um, again, the same day is at the very end of the book, chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, and it talks about the future leadership of Zerubbabel, who was the governor at the time. 
And it says, um, it, it gives a second reference to this future event, the shaking of heaven and earth. And it, uh, this time it connects it to Zerubbabel and him being made like a signet, some sign of authority uh, as of kings. Now we know Zerubbabel did not become a king. So is the prophecy wrong? The interpretation is that Jesus being through the line of Zerubbabel fulfills this prophecy. And that's the perspective that we're so, supposed to take with this. So like I said, we could study each of these reports in detail. I just want to look at the first two to try and apply it to our lives this morning. <clears throat> so let's start by reading chapter 1, verses 2 through 9. It'll be partially reading uh, the reading that we had this morning. Um, but let's look at this again. <clears throat> and as we read this, remember, Haggai is trying to convince them to motivate the temple again. Motivate rebuilding the temple again. And as we read it, we're going to see they waited. For some reason, they decided now's not the time. What I'd like for you to do this, this morning as we read it is ask yourself, why were they waiting? And the reason I'm asking you that is because we're going to examine ourselves this morning. There are things we know we need to do, and we wait for some reason. We decide now's not the time. So learn from their mistakes, and as we read this this morning, Try and understand and dissect it. Why were they waiting? All right, chapter 1, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much, but you harvest little. You eat but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put them in a purse with holes. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house, which dies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. <clears throat> all right. A couple points. First of all, they knew the temple needed to be rebuilt. They never, they always acknowledged that. You know, sometimes the barrier to our relationship with God, sometimes it can be ignorance. Sometimes it can be just lack of knowledge, not knowing how this relationship works, how we should, how our lives should be. Sometimes ignorance is the problem. It was not the problem here. They knew that the temple needed to be rebuilt. They knew it was necessary. They simply had convinced themselves that it didn't need to now, that now was not the time. And so apply that to yourself. We also, in our Bible study and talking with others, we become aware of things that we need to change. It comes to our attention like, I could do better in this area. I need to change and cut this thing out of my life. And for some reason, we convince ourselves to wait for some reason. <clears throat> and it, it's a worthwhile exercise. Later we'll talk about some instruction that God gives them to consider your ways. It's a worthwhile exercise to reflect on yourself. What is it that I need to cut out of my life? What is it that I need to change and start doing? And then ask yourself, why am I waiting for that? So to understand that question, let's ask exactly what we were looking at before. Why did they wait? And I want to make a couple of points. We have some hints at what may have motivated them to wait, and it's worth looking into for us. So the first, discouragement from the world and outsiders. So we read about those adversaries, the local people who were discouraging them and, and delayed work in the first place. <clears throat> And this is applicable to us as well. We can be discouraged because we may anticipate ridicule from the world. We may anticipate people mocking us. Um, <clears throat> maybe you anticipate not being able to engage in some of the same activities that you had before you commit yourself to Christ. And it's similar to what they were dealing with here. They had outside influence that discouraged the work. And in the same way, we can be discouraged from the world and the worldly perspective of things. Discouragement from the world and outsiders. Point number two that could have, that 
brought on their waiting was they were more interested in building up treasures on earth. They were more interested in their own house, and God brings this to their attention through Haggai twice in this first report. <clears throat> and this is applicable to us. Sometimes we might say to ourselves, you know, I'm, I'm dedicating a lot of time to this work project, or maybe it's some school project, and once this finishes, it just it, it, it's, it takes up a lot of time, but once it's done, then... Then I'll get more into and in, in, in more concerned with my relationship with God. Um, but right now, this job needs to take first priority, and it doesn't have to be a job. It could be your education. It could be um, sports, leisure activities, hobbies. Anytime you say to yourself, "I want to put it off," and you you only you know why you're doing that, and it's worthwhile to consider it. Commitment to God means priority prioritizing that relationship, the one with God, um, before any other, every other thing that might take away any of our time. Point number three, why did they wait? They never took time to consider their ways. Eventually, they did start rebuilding the temple following Haggai's message. Eventually, they did decide, no, now is the time. But it wasn't after until two, in, two times in this, in this first prophecy, God gives the instruction, consider your ways. You want a relationship with me, God says? You've never taken the time to even reflect on your relationship with me. How is your relationship with God this morning? Have you considered it? Is it where it needs to be this morning? Is there a temple God needs you to build? And you've decided, yeah, but I don't want to. It's a scary decision. Consider your ways this morning. God gives them this instruction two times. And, you know, Christians, we're given a similar instruction. We Earlier today, we partook of communion. Yes, we reflect on, on Christ, but we're also told to examine ourselves. And it's not a, a blind examination. It's a focused examination in that it's an examination that accompanies our reflection on Christ. We remember Christ. We remember what he fulfilled, what he did, the most important event in history. And then in that context, we consider, who am I? What am I? What's my relationship with God? God is giving us the same instruction that he's given his people every single week. Examine yourself. Consider your ways. Not blindly, in the context of Christ's sacrifice. Consider your ways this morning. Why did they wait? Maybe complacency. <clears throat> This one's not in the text, and maybe I'm reaching a little bit, but perhaps they felt complacent because what's the first thing they did when they got back, at least when we read about it in Ezra? They built the altar. They celebrated the Feast of Booths. You know, I, I wonder if they sat there and they said, at least we got the altar. We're worshiping. We're offering sacrifices. Isn't that enough? And maybe this morning you say, well, I'm here, aren't I? I go to church on Sunday. My altar's built. A false sense of security. Don't grow complacent. Our relationship with God is a matter of the heart. And a heart right with God that is a faithful heart will, by nature, manifest in certain behaviors and certain priorities. It'll change the way you are. A heart that's right with God. And for sure, that includes worship. But our worship can be in vain as well, as was theirs. And actually, if we flip, we're not going to talk much about the third report. But in verse 214, God makes it clear to them that um, their work, the work of their hands is defiled and what they offer at the altar is unclean. Because they were defiled. Because their heart wasn't right. <clears throat> you recall what David said after his... Sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, 16 through 17. It reads, For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Sacrifice has never been without faithfulness to God and without a, heart, a, a right heart. And, and Paul actually describes this in 
throughout many of his letters to the Galatians, to the Corinthians, that Abraham was a man of faith. Many, many years before, Abraham, faith is what saved Abraham, Paul argues, actually. Um, and so our heart has to be in the right place in order for anything. Our worship can be in vain is the point that I'm making this morning. It was for them, and it can be for us today. Consider your ways. Why did they wait? You know, they might have been discouraged by their perceived inability to build a temple that was worthy. Okay, and we know that they built the foundation and they looked at it and they said, it doesn't seem good enough. It doesn't seem as good as the first one. And that might have been discouraging to look at it and think, I can't, do, I, I can't build a good enough temple. And God's message in the second one is, <clears throat> is take confidence. I'm with you anyway. And, and guess what? Coming is a future house that will be more glorious than the first one. It's unshakable, and we're going to look at that in a minute. Um, but before, just apply that to yourself this morning. Um, sometimes I, I, I think for, for many people, a struggle in coming to God is to think that my sin is, I have too much sin. God can't overcome the sin in my life. I can't change. I'm not good enough. Um, that is a major underestimation of the, of the power of the cross. <clears throat> you don't have to be good enough to save yourself to go to heaven. Christ redeemed you through your blood, through his blood. He has paid the price for your sin. And he provides the mean to, to cleanse a guilty conscience, Paul tells us. Get to know Christ. And like I said, the second report deals with this. So let's look at the second report as we close this morning. Chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations, and they will come to the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give you peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So he talks about a future temple. What are some of the characteristics of this future temple? Well, it'll be filled with glory that's greater than the first one. All nations are going to come to it. It'll be a place of peace. What did Paul say was the peace that surpasses understanding? It comes through Christ. And it will be unshakable, apparently. Everlasting, And this last piece, the fact that it's unshakable, is made clear to us by the writer of Hebrews. So if you would, considering this prophecy of Haggai, turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. The writer talks about this. The writer of Hebrews. Um, you know, all throughout the book of Hebrews, it contrasts things of the Old Covenant, the... Um, you know, the physical types of the Old Covenant with the spiritual, authentic anti-types of the, of the New Covenant, the one that was inaugurated with Jesus' blood. That's happening all throughout this book. And here, starting in chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 18, Mount Sinai is being contrasted with this, this thing called Mount Zion, which is introduced here. And here's what we learn about this, this, this Mount Zion. While Sinai was a physical mountain, Zion is a heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, Sinai was unapproachable. People couldn't come to the mountain, they would die. But we can approach, apparently, this Zion with confidence. Um, the people who the writer of Hebrews is writing to, um, they apparently had already come to this Zion, actually. We read that in verse 22. Let's read that, actually. Let's read verse 22 of, of Hebrews 12 uh, through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, the thing that's being contrasted with Sinai, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly, to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, uh, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. 
So having come to this Zion apparently is analogous with coming to the city of God, to the general assembly or the church, those who are enrolled in heaven. It's analogous with coming to God, to the righteous made perfect. That's probably the faithful prior to Christ. Christ redeemed them as well. Coming to Jesus. All of those things are, are the same. And the Hebrews writer is exhorting his readers, make sure you come to this Zion and stay there. That's in verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him warned them on earth, much less will we escape and turn away from him who warns from heaven. And then we get the reference to Haggai 2.6 in verse 26 of chapter 12 of Hebrews. It says, And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. So what was Haggai talking about when he said once more? Keep reading. Verse 27. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So what did Haggai mean when he prophesied by God once more? He meant that, you know, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the old temple. This next one will be unshakable. Everlasting. It's not physical. No one can take it from you. Praise God. Just like Jesus said, all the prophets spoke of these times. So too, Haggai is relaying this message hundreds of years prior to the coming of Christ. And now, you and I are in the midst of this final shaking. Christ has come and established His church. And this should be motivating for us. In the same way that those returning exiles were living in the time of a prophesied restoration, Jeremiah prophesied that they would be restored, that they would come back to the Holy Land. He prophesied that, and they were living in the midst of it. That should have been motivating for them. And so too, for us, this should be motivating to realize we have, we have hindsight is to our advantage. That we can see everything played out exactly as it was supposed to, and Jesus has come and He delivered on the promise from the time that sin was introduced way back with Adam and Eve. We've finally been redeemed. And here we are in these last times. And would you neglect so great a warning as was just given? Join the kingdom that's everlasting. This morning, let's follow the same instruction given by God in Haggai. Consider your ways this morning. The church is firmly established and it's not going anywhere. But I and you can be complacent. The church is firmly established. It's not going in anywhere. But we can misplace our priorities. <clears throat> Just like those people did. The church is firmly established. It's not going anywhere. No one's going to destroy this unshakable kingdom. But you and I can choose not to submit. And so you ask yourself this morning, what change do I need to make for God? You know, it may not be, I need to build some physical temple, but, but it might be similar because Paul tells the Corinthians and those in Ephesus and the writer of Hebrews also says that the dwelling place of God, which God dwelled with the Israelites among the temple, the dwelling place now is within us. Have you constructed that temple? Are you concerned with it this morning? If you know you want a better relationship with God, but you're unsure of what that looks like, if you want to study Bible with someone, maybe, maybe it is lack of knowledge this morning. Don't wait another day. I'm sure that I would, I would study Bible with you. I'm sure there's many people here who would study Bible with you. Don't wait another day. Figure this thing out because it's the most important relationship you'll have in your life. And if you, don't, <clears throat> if you do know what you need to do, then why are you waiting? And that's a serious exercise that everyone should take upon themselves. Why do I wait? What is so important? They had convinced themselves that now was not the time. But I'll panel my house. What are you spending time on then? It's important to identify that as well this, this morning. Why are you waiting? This morning I encourage you to wait no longer. <clears throat> Again, if you, if you need to study with someone, if you need prayers this morning, if you need to be baptized this morning to submit to the kingdom, this unshakable kingdom that Christ has come and through His blood paid for all of our sins. I encourage you to submit this morning and come forward as we stand and sing.